Now, most people know about the DNA code as the language of life. Now scientists have discovered the epigenetic code. What is it and how does it confirm creation? This week on Creation Magazine Live. Welcome to Creation Magazine Live. My name is Richard Fangrad. And I'm Calvin Smith. And our topic this week is epigenetics. What is it and how does it confirm creation? Right. So almost everyone today is familiar with DNA, the language of life. And DNA is made up of four chemical letters which are spelled out in three letter words called codons. And these words spell out all the information for what organisms being studied, whether it's birds or grass or people, etc. So uh, every person's DNA is, is unique, of course, and DNA testing can be used to identify individuals because of their unique DNA makeup. Right. As we've covered before on the show, the presence of a coded language system is startling evidence for creation because language systems have always been observed to have originated from an intelligent mind. To believe otherwise is actually unscientific because atheistic evolutionists must believe that at some point matter gave rise to a language while a decoding device, a translation device of some kind, for that specific code spontaneously arose at the same time with no intelligence. This goes against anything and everything that scientists have ever observed. It's a faith position, but many evolutionists believe that once upon a time, that's what happened. Right. And well, things have even gotten more uh, unbelievable for materialists since DNA was discovered. Right. Back in 2005, a group of researchers published a landmark study on, on a question that's been long uh, puzzling geneticists. Why aren't identical twins identical? identical. Yeah. <laughs> Considering that they have the same DNA sequence in each of their cells, it seems a bit strange that they might you know, possess significant numbers of physical differences, yep. um, such as uh, different fingerprints, uh, different uh, susceptibilities to disease. And so this raises the question, if two people can have identical DNA sequences and yet be so different, is there more to our genetic blueprint than just DNA? And the answer, of course, is an emphatic yes. Yes, yeah. Many people are familiar with DNA, but fewer are aware that the DNA code itself is governed by another code, a code known as the epigenetic code. This code is so significant that one science writer said that genes, so stretches of DNA, are, are little more than puppets, is the way it was described. <laughs> uh, whereas the enzymes controlling this other code are really the master puppeteers, is the terminology that he used. So, so what have researchers found? Uh, put simply, identical twins possess the same DNA code, but different epigenetic codes. Right. They found that the epigenetic codes of identical twins, though in, uh, indistinguishable during their early years of life, can diverge markedly as they age. Also, epigenetic differences were greater in identical twins that lived apart and that had, of course, different lifestyles. Right. Mutations in the DNA are often regarded as the chief culprits of disease, but epigenetic errors can have equally devastating effects. Biologists have known since the 1970s that DNA in cancer cells, for example, has an unusually high level of methylation, suggesting that crucial genes may be switched off. Now, methylation, meth methylation is a process by which methyl groups, these are chemicals that come from methane, are added to the DNA. Right. And, and tumor suppressor genes, as their name suggests, are required for normal development. And, and several instances have been found where these are switched off by methylation and directly linked to cancer. Uh, alternatively, uh, researchers have noted that cancer genes, oncogenes, can be activated through demethylide. Uh, methylation. Methylation. Yes. However, adding or removing chemical groups can reverse epigenetic changes, so the race is now on to develop drugs that control key epigenetic uh, uh, enzymes. Yeah. One, one such drug has already been approved in the U.S. For, uh, to, to, to treat a type of uh, pre-leukemia, and even commentary dietary, uh, common dietary components such as green tea can prevent or reverse the effects of cancer by inhibiting certain enzymes and reactivating switched-off genes. It's quite fascinating. So cancer research 
uh, however, is just the tip of the iceberg. What causes schizophrenia or, or autism? Right. Why yeah. are children born uh, through in vitro fertilization more likely to have epigenetic disorders? These are key questions epigenetic researchers uh, hope to answer. Yeah, the added levels of complexity that scientists are discovering within living things is, is mind-boggling, truly staggering. And of course, it's no help to the theory of evolution because they have to explain how interlinking code could possibly have arisen at the same time. And we'll explore these amazing discoveries in more detail in just a few minutes. In 1994, the prestigious journal Science shocked the scientific world by publishing sequence data from DNA retrieved from dinosaur bone said to be 80 million years old. DNA is a fragile molecule and so it breaks down quickly. Measurements of DNA stability suggest it could last thousands of years at best under the likely conditions. But 80 million years was just too incredible for other skeptical scientists. Eventually, these skeptics were vindicated as it became apparent that the original researchers had sequenced contaminating human DNA, not dinosaur DNA. However, in 2012, a different group of researchers published new results supporting the discovery of actual dinosaur DNA. These new results appear much harder to disprove, with the researchers applying multiple checks against contamination from non-dinosaur sources. The preservation of dinosaur DNA doesn't make sense from an evolutionary perspective, but it fits biblical history, whereby dinosaurs lived thousands of years ago, not millions of years ago. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. Well, if you just tuned in this week, we're talking about epigenetics. What is it and how does it confirm creation? Right. Scientists at Duke University recently managed to radically alter a group of mice without altering one letter of their DNA. Agouti mice, so-called because they have the agouti gene, are typically yellow, obese, and highly susceptible to cancer and type 2 diabetes. These poor mice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, however, this experiment produced mice that were brown, slender, and didn't share their parents' vulnerability for disease, uh, despite carrying the dominant agouti gene. Right. Amazing. Well, but what makes the transformation uh, so remarkable is the way it was achieved, uh, simply by feeding the pregnant mothers a methyl-rich diet, hmm. which managed to switch off the, the harmful agouti gene. And not only can uh, the, the mother's diet profoundly affect gene expression in her children, but also her grandchildren and possibly succeeding generations uh, beyond that. So, as one writer uh, uh, equipped, you are what your grandmother ate. <laughs> yeah. yeah, amazing. Uh, the fact that a mother's diet during pregnancy can impact the epigenome of her grandchildren may explain why human populations that suffer fam famine, for example, can, uh, can continue to see health problems in well-nourished future generations. Some have suggested that the obesity epidemic in some Western countries may partly be due to the lifestyles and nutrition of past generations. That's right. fascinating. You know, when, when Dolly the sheep, when she was, you know, cloned yeah, over yeah, a decade famous. ago, yeah. Yeah, uh, many believed that uh, cloning animals would soon be easy and routine, basically. Right. Uh, however, progress has been uh, frustratingly slow as scientists have realized that the epigenetic code um, is far less amenable to cloning than the DNA code. Since the epigenetic profile of DNA changes over time, the epigenome of a, of a six-year-old sheep is very different from that required uh, just after fertilization. Yeah, so the egg has to erase the DNA's epigenetic profile and reprogram it appropriately. Dolly's uh, creator commented, uh, he said this, when you think about it, when you think about what we're asking the egg to do for us, in a way, I think we should still be surprised that cloning works at all. <laughs> Fascinating comment. Right. So, did epi epigenetics uh, code evolve? Um, right. Well, yeah. the, the core histone proteins that package DNA aren't possessed by anything higher than bacteria on the evolutionary tree of life. Therefore, many believe that the histone code has been uh, uh, regulating gene expression for at least 2.7 billion years when the first cells were organized uh, with an organized um, nucleus supposedly evolved. Right, but just because higher life forms package their DNA in much the same way doesn't necessarily mean that they all descended from a common ancestor. Uh, even though an architect may design totally different structures, on closer inspection many of the concepts and materials used to build them would be similar. So why can't the architect of life do the same? Exactly. Well, the famous uh, evolutionary, evolutionary biologist uh, Theodosius Dobansky, Dobansky once yeah. claimed that 
nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. Well, if this statement were true, uh, you'd expect that uh, unraveling the complexity complexities of uh, the epigenetic control would rely strongly on the light of evolution, but as one researcher candidly admitted, um, while the role of epigenetic inheritance is in, in development is becoming a major subject of biological research, the study of its implications for evolution is lagging far behind. Wow. <laughs> so here we have yet another example where biological research has flourished without any need for evolutionary belief or speculation. But now that we know the DNA has another layer of coded instructions and thus another layer of complexity, will more scientists attribute this to an intelligent designer? <laughs> Seriously, doubt it. Uh, <laughs> DNA already has uh, some pretty impressive credentials all on its own. Right. Another layer of complexity uh, isn't likely to budge someone already committed to explaining the universe purely in naturalistic terms. Right. As world-renowned uh, geneticist Richard Lewontin declared, we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. Yeah, famous quote. Yeah. Uh, what it really comes down to with many Bible skeptics is a simple willing suppression of the truth, Romans 1, mm -hmm. uh, of the God of the Bible. But the level of sophistication of design scientists uh, that, that design scientists are discovering in, in living things is actually just more proof of the truth that there is a master designer. Exactly. And more about this uh, amazing evidence of design when we return. Many Christians today have a diminished view of the Bible because they can't answer questions like is there really a God? What about evolution? Are there facts to back up the Bible? Or is it all just faith? Creation Ministries expert speakers visit churches all over the world to help pastors equip their congregations to understand that the whole Bible, even Genesis, is accurate. We help to demolish the arguments that the world uses to try to convince people that the Bible isn't true. For more information on getting a CMI speaker to visit your church, contact your nearest CMI office through our website. All right, on this week's episode, we're talking about epigenetics. What is it, and how does it confirm creation? That's our topic. So, the epigenetic code controls gene expression in two major ways. The first of these is related to uh, the way DNA is packaged. Inside the cell nucleus, DNA is wrapped around proteins called histones, and these proteins can be bunched together tightly or loosely, depending on the chemical environment. This is significant because to utilize the information in DNA, certain proteins need to access um, these so they can bind to it. Right, if the histones are packaged too tightly, the DNA can't be accessed. It's a bit like arriving in a library after it's closed. After closing time, the information's still all there, but it's not accessible anymore. Right. So when the histones are bunched together tightly, gene expression is prevented. But when they are loosely bunched, gene expression is allowed. This form of control is referred to as the histone code. So here's another code. Right. The histone code. So the second way uh, the epigenetic code controls gene expression is by attaching or detaching chemical groups to the DNA itself. So methyl groups are, are small chemical clusters that attach to DNA and switch off or prevent genes from being expressed. This form of regulation is known as DNA methylation. Right, so the histone code and DNA methylation provide an epigenetic code which is a heritable physical and chemical code that controls gene expression. It's a bit like a, a stage manager at a concert. Uh, the stage manager choreographs when certain acts or genes play their part in the concert of life, if you want to think of it that way. What's more, the epigenetic code is a dynamic code that changes throughout development and in response to the environment. Right. Fascinating. Yeah. So, so this code has the ability to cause changes in one generation of organisms that can be passed on to the next generation. And to some, this sounds like a, a return of the old 1800s idea of a Lamarckian yes, evolution, right? Yeah. Which is the in inheritance of acquired traits. Yeah, Lamarck's idea was that uh, giraffe-like ancestors stretch their necks and stretch their necks to reach the leaves on trees. Then its offspring could have even longer necks. And, or, or if that someone, uh, if someone built up their muscles while they were alive, they could pass on large muscles to their children. That, that was the idea. Right, which is course completely false. Yes. <laughs> if no. I cut off my finger, it doesn't mean my kids are going to be born With, without fingers. Without fingers, right. Um, because the, the coded information for every part of, uh, you know, is coded in my DNA. So yep. changes uh, must affect DNA for changes in the organism 
to happen, obviously. Right. With few exceptions, Darwin um, pulled no punches in his Origin of Species, which was published in 1859, claiming that all current species descend from common ancestors and that natural selection is the driving agent of change. That's what he was saying. And this is what most people think of today when they think about Darwin's ideas of evolution. That's what right. they think about. Well, nearly a, a decade after uh, his book Origin was published, Darwin produced variations of plants and animals under domestication, another uh, publication in eight, uh, 1868. In this book, he first uh, suggests a model of inheritance he called pangenesis. And while trying to explain the mode of inheritance and, and source of variation, Darwin imagined corpuscles being produced by the various body parts in response to environmental stresses. And these corpuscles would uh, travel to the gonads to be passed on to the next generation. And uh, of course, this idea of uh, pangenesis is Lamarckian to the core. Right, yeah. In The Descent of Man in 1871, he attempts to lay out his reasoning and evidences for his idea that man and apes have a common ancestor. But in so doing, he also answers several objections uh, people had to his main thesis in Origin, back in Origin. Yeah, and he, he actually backed off this idea that you know natural selection was the only uh, engine of evolution. Right. In its place, he says that, well, it's a combination of natural selection operating on variation caused by the uh, hypothetical and, and Lamarckian process of pangenesis and sexual selection. Uh, they're, they're the driving forces. He also alluded to uh, a group selection and kin selection. Sexual selection theory uh, has been controversial since its inception and has uh, has had some huge setbacks recently, right. and his pangenesis idea is demonstrably false. Uh, one is left wondering what exactly people mean when they say Darwinian evolution. <laughs> right. And uh, we'll be back in just uh, 60 seconds. Stromatolites are regarded by many as the oldest fossils on Earth. They are interpreted as the remains of colonies of blue-green algae, or more accurately, cyanobacteria. The oldest ones are claimed to be 3.5 billion years old. Within this evolutionary perspective, one would expect these colonies to have radically changed, but remarkably, they are essentially the same today. Stromatolites, therefore, are classic examples of living fossils. Living fossils cause major problems for evolution because they provide stunning examples of how evolution hasn't occurred. They also call into question the evolution evolutionary time frame. Some people try to downplay the significance of living fossils by arguing that when something is well adapted to its environment, it doesn't need to change. But this would need the environment to be constant for the supposed period of time. This argument cannot apply to stromatolites, because during 3.5 billion years of alleged evolutionary time, many radical environment changes supposedly occurred, including the arrival of new predators and parasites. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. Welcome back. Our subject this week is epigenetics. What is it and how does it confirm creation? So as epigenetics is becoming established as a force to be reckoned with, it's simultaneously uh, challenging strict orthodox Darwinism. Why? Because non-permanent changes act like a moving target for natural selection. Yeah. By definition, <laughs> the ability of natural selection to influence the distribution of genes in the next generation depends on the, the, the phenotype, the physical characteristics of an organism. Right. Uh, if, if the environment can affect the phenotype in an inheritable manner, individuals will be falsely targeted. Then when the epigenetic modification is reset, natural selection is sent back to square one and, uh, and the less fit individuals were selected against in vain. Right. Uh, and Darwinian evolution can't handle this, uh, for, for example. Uh, say that the diet of mice generates epigenetic changes in the offspring that result in a coat color change that gives good camouflage, let's say. Mice without that coat color could be at a disadvantage. However, there's no difference in the underlying genes that determine coat color. The mice have different colors because of something that they ate. Some individuals would be eliminated that had no genetic disability, and when the effect wears off, all that selection would have, all that selection would have been wasted. Exactly. In fact, considering uh, that epigenetic changes seem to be designed, um, you know, to have a significant effect, they seem to be more powerful than most mutations, yes. which generally have little to no effect on, on individual. Most right. of them are neutral. So natural selection needs to be able to see mutations, so to speak, but most yep. mutations are so weak as to be invisible. 
Epigenetics adds a lot of noise, making it even harder for natural selection to operate. How can evolution proceed if natural selection cannot remove mutations? That's one of the puzzles that epigenetics creates. Yeah, just like Darwin, uh, Darwin's claims that a mixture of forces, natural selection, sexual selection, Lamarckianism, that kind of thing, yep. causes evolution to proceed, the modern evolutionist also believes in a mixture of forces. Natural selection, uh, neutral drift, and now epigenetic modification. Uh, so we've come full circle, and evolution theory is as unresolved as it ever was. Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, what epigenetics demonstrates, of course, is, is brilliant design. Yes. Um, yep. ju just like the designer of a vehicle might build, uh, you know, build in variants designed to deal with different terrain, weather right. conditions of work, uh, work needs or something like that. A truck can have a four-wheel drive uh, mechanism, but it would, would not be, um, need to be activated until it was being used in rough terrain. Right, so you don't normally not activate it in good road conditions, as it you know would burn more fuel or whatever. But if you needed it, it could be brought online. This is what we're seeing with epigenetics. Right. Yeah. Similarly, it might have a cap when use in transporting items in, in wet weather, let's say, yeah. uh, or it might you might be able to remove that when hauling longer items so that they could stick out the back. Uh, it, it could toggle between day day night and fog lights and <laughs> that kind of thing depending on conditions. Yeah. The the idea being that a designer has planned for Sight into the various features of the unit that it might use in a variety of situations. And this is the same kind of design variation that scientists are observing in living things, except to a degree that would put our most brilliant designs and, our, and, and engineers to absolute shame. <laughs> so this, this field of epigenetics will continue to display the glory of God's handiwork by demonstrating that living things have an inbuilt ability to activate genetic programming yeah. already contained within the organism. It's not new. And, and this is uh, not, of course, what evolution is, is uh, supposed to do. Yeah, it's a fascinating, fascinating study. Yeah. Evolution is supposedly a mechanism whereby creatures can gain new forms and functions and features that never existed before. A diagnostic program that can sense what is needed in certain environments and activate programming for features already present demonstrates foresight, not a random process. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> if you want to know more about uh, epigenetics, um, in the, uh, the book by Dr. Jonathan Sarfati uh, called By Design, he has a section in there that goes into these types of things, but yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's far more comprehensive than, than just that. It goes into all sorts of design features and living things, and, and of course there's a whole movement out there right now called the Intelligent Design Movement, but many of them right. aren't even yep. Christians, so uh, Jonathan's book you know, identifies the designer, uh, you know, yes, the, yeah, the, God, of the, the, the God of the is. Bible, uh, don't, you know. Don't leave that, that uh, question unanswered, that who the designer of, is. But you can yeah. get a, the viewers of this program can get a, uh, can get 30% off of that book. If you go to creation.com and when you check out, type in the coupon code CMLBD, Creation Magazine Live by Design, you get 30% off of that fascinating resource. And we'll be right back. The reason that the Creation Answers book is so popular is because it covers a huge range of topics and answers more than 60 of the most asked questions about Genesis and the creation evolution issue. Questions like, what is the evidence for God's existence? Could the days in Genesis 1 be long periods of time? How did all the animals fit on Noah's Ark? Does radioisotope dating prove that the Earth is very old? Where do dinosaurs fit into the Bible? And many more. To order your copy, visit creation.com. Well, welcome back. Uh, this is the In the News segment. Where there's always stuff about uh, evolution uh, in the always. news. Always. Yep. And uh, it's good once you know, someone gets educated in this area, you know, when they read articles like we're going to talk about here, and trying to put that in the context of biblical history and, okay, how does that relate to actually what God's Word says versus an evolutionary view? Right. You can understand that more. So I'm just going to read a portion of it here, yeah, and uh, people mean, can get an idea. Th these things are always, the, the news reports, new discoveries are always delivered to us in a nice little evolutionary packaging, right? right? And so it's, it's important to develop skills to take that packaging off and see it for what it is. Exactly. So here, here's the article. It was termite super swarm threatens South Florida. Awesome. Yeah. Two of the world's most destructive termite species are swarming South Florida. And the fact that they're mating has scientists sweating. <laughs> the Asian okay. and Formosan subterranean termite species are producing hundreds of thousands of winged males and females. Uh, 
which are in turn creating hybrid colonies, according to University of Florida's uh, entomologists. The two species are no joke, and the hybrid colonies could prove even more disastrous, uh, disastrous to homeowners. Uh, they're uh, two of the most destructive termite species in the world. University of Florida entomology professor uh, Nanyo uh, Su told foxnews.com, the common name for Formosan subterranean termites in China and Japan is house termite, as it can literally bring down a house, uh, usually uh, starting with the roof as they chew through the, uh, the supporting beams. Awesome. So uh, termite <laughs> colonies, sometimes consisting of millions of individuals, can live up to 20 years and thrive in South Florida, where the temperatures uh, offer ideal mating conditions. So we've got these termites, um, two different species of termites. Okay. They're coming together and they're forming a new species of termites, right. and they can do really good things and rip through houses and, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, wow. Uh, a little bit lower in the article, it says, what makes the emergence of hybrid colonies so alarming is that they're reproducing at a rate that is more than twice as fast as the parent species known as hybrid vigor. Uh, this offers a few troubling scenarios. Uh, the article says that the hybrid colonies could reach maturity faster uh, in two to three years as opposed to the parent species maturing in five to six, or that they could form a much larger colony of five million to ten million termites per colony as opposed to two to five million. Right. Interesting. So what happens is these types of uh, articles come out and they're always put in evolutionary context. So what you're starting to hear now is look, at these. this is a new species of, of termite, right? So this yeah. is like evolution in action. Right. Because evolutionists would say that, you know, and, and so they're, they're surprised now that specia uh, speciation can happen uh, so quickly because uh, evolutionists at one time thought, well, this would take a long, long time. And here we are seeing it. Now, we yeah. did a couple episodes uh, in season four. Yeah, last year. Yeah. Uh, episode, episode 20, 20 and 21, 21. two-part series there right. on speciation. So we expect... We're not surprised by rapid speciation. Right. Evolutionists, are, they expect speciation as part of their model as well, but they expect, of course, it's, they've got the millions of years thrown at it, and it's right. supposed to go slowly over millions of years, and they're surprised when they see, here's a good example, rapid speciation. Right. Doesn't surprise that, us. That's why one of the episodes was called uh, Speciation, Yes, Evolution, Evolution no. no. So we'd no. expect that because, of course, this uh, goes back to uh, the concept uh, even before genetics were really explored, right? The fact that uh, if if two of every seven of some animals got on the ark, got off the ark, and then, you know, we would expect rapid speciation after the flood and, right. and that yeah. kind of thing. So, and we we talked about hybridization in those in those episodes as well. Those are those some some good episodes deal with, dealing with some basics in biology of how uh, different things can come together, and if they can produce viable offspring, that's a good indication they were part of the original created kind. Right. So next week. We're going to be talking about, did God really say? That's next week. Is Genesis real history? We'll see you then.